Hi, everybody. Welcome in. Hello, Alex. Getting the YouTube live set up really quick. Great. All right. So I think a couple more people are trickling in. Um, as usual, if you could keep yourself muted unless you are uh, actively asking a question, um, that'll make sure that there isn't any feedback on the, on the audio. That'd be great. Awesome. So I'll give a little bit of background. Um, the mission of the San Lucia Conservancy is to protect, steward, and enhance the unique natural and aesthetic resources in the San Lucia Preserve while promoting ecologically compatible development. The Conservancy partners with the preserve community to care for over 18,000 acres of protected lands through adaptive man land management, research, and education. With 36 ponds scattered across the landscape, the preserve is home to a host of aquatic species, including California red-legged frog, which has been listed as ESA threatened since 1996. In this ecology talk, Dr. Rachel Anderson will explain the plight of one of our most vulnerable amphibians and discuss her research, which will hopefully give us a better idea of how we can bring these species back from the brink. Rachel Anderson works as a biology professor at West Valley College. She completed her graduate work in ecology and herpetology at UC Davis, where she studied the interaction of threatened native California red legged frog and the invasive American bullfrog. She conducted much of her field work on the Monterey Peninsula, including at ponds within the Santa Lucia Preserve. She continues to participate in conservation and restoration efforts on the peninsula, including ongoing work and monitoring at Animus Pond. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and she will present for about 45 minutes and then we'll be about 15 minutes for questions at the end. Okay, well, thank you so much for that introduction, Alex. And I will aim to you know, talk for about 45 minutes. Once I get started talking about frogs, it can be hard to slow me down. So <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to cut myself off at about that time, but I'm excited to talk about some of the research that I conducted on the preserve. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and pull up my presentation and get to show you some photos of some of these really great species. Let's see. And let's play from current slide. Everybody see that? Can you give me a thumbs up? All right, awesome. So as Alex said, I'm Rachel Anderson and I conducted amphibian surveys on the Santa Lucia Preserve as part of my dissertation research from about 2014 to 2017. So much of my research was conducted looking at California red-legged frogs that were present at ponds on the preserve. And I love to talk about my favorite species of frog, which is the California red-legged frog. And I love to talk about frogs in general. So thank you this evening for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit and nerd a little bit out about these amphibians. On this slide here, what you're seeing on the right is my hand holding a California red-legged frog, showing those beautiful characteristic red legs and the underside of the abdomen. And in order to be able to hold this frog like I am in this picture, I went through a years-long application process to get state and federal permits to let me hold this frog. If you see a California red-legged frog on your property, awesome, admire it from afar. I would encourage you to not do what I'm doing here. Don't touch it or grab it. You know, even scaring a red-legged frog into the water could be considered take under federal law, which because these frogs are protected by the Endangered Species Act could technically net you a fine of thousands of dollars. And that should give you an idea of how important these frogs are and how lucky we are to have them in such abundance locally. So for this evening, I've put together a somewhat informal presentation, introducing you to some local amphibians and talking specifically about the biology and ecology of the California red-legged frog, some of its threats, some of my dissertation work on the species, and I promise not to show you too many graphs, and a little about these frogs and work that's being done with them on the Santa Lucia Preserve. If you have questions as I'm going through the slides, feel free to unmute yourself to interject or use the hand raise reaction in Zoom, or you can type into the chat and I can respond to any of those or you can save questions until the end. So here's a little introduction to some of our local pond dwelling amphibians. In California in general and locally on the Monterey Peninsula, 
there aren't too many pond breeding amphibians that are found on the preserve, but all of the ones that we do have have a lot of character. At the top left here, what you're seeing is an American bullfrog that's introduced from the East Coast. And these are huge frogs. That's my hand holding that individual. He's really big. And we can see big females that approach the size of a dinner plate. These are some really, really large frogs. These frogs are really present in human dominated areas where humans have modified the habitat. These frogs were uh, introduced from the East Coast deliberately by humans who really wanted to eat those big juicy frog legs and potentially by sentimental East Coasters who really missed the sounds of home. They really wanted to hear those deep bullfrog songs during the summer. At the bottom left is another species that's resident on the preserve. That's the Sierran chorus frog. These are relatively small frogs. Um, these are the ones that you hear calling from just about any puddle or rain barrel on in the habitat. They're probably starting about this time of year and calling through the late spring. And when they assemble in big numbers, their chorus can be deafening. A fun fact about these is that they're really resident to California. So, you know, what else is resident to California? A lot of TV and movie sets. So when you watch TV shows, watch movies, often you'll hear a chorus of these frogs in the background, even if it's supposed to be set somewhere else in the world. It's a clue that that show was filmed in California. At the center here is the Western toad. It's a more dry and terrestrial species but it comes to ponds to breed. And a fun fact about toads is that they're the only frogs that walk in addition to jumping. They can move one leg at a time. At the top right is the California tiger salamander. Everybody knows and loves this endangered species, which is found at some ponds on the preserve and in ground squirrel burrows throughout the upland habitat. And at the bottom right is the California newt. Another species that's highly terrestrial during the dry season, but during this time of year is swarming to breeding ponds and they're forming what's known as uh, mating balls, also known as newt orgies. They're reproducing at breeding ponds at this time of year. So all of these can move around in the terrestrial environment that is away from ponds, but they're all tied to water for reproduction. They lay eggs in the water, and they have aquatic stages like tadpoles. But obviously I'm leaving out the number one coolest frog that's found on the preserve, and that's the California red-legged frog and the subject of my research. The California red-legged frog, you'll see me abbreviate sometimes as CRLF, and hopefully I'll avoid using its scientific name, Rana Draytonii. And here on this slide, I have pictures of all of the different life stages of California red-legged frogs. California red-legged frogs are California's largest native frog. They're a moderately sized frog, maybe at the adult size, about the size of a baseball. So not rivaling those dinner plate sized bullfrogs I was telling you about, but still pretty substantial frogs. The back of these frogs tends to be brownish, reddish, grayish with black flecks, and then underneath a lighter cream color with flecks. They also have a dark mask with this light section that looks sort of like a milk mustache on their face. It's just their underside of their hind legs and their lower abdomen that tends to be red. You rarely see frogs that are you know, bright tomato red, but they're typically more brownish, like the picture at the top right. They are a federally threatened species, which means that they're protected by the Endangered Species Act, and they're considered a species of special concern by the state of California. And I'll talk a little bit more about threats and legal protections in a little bit. They are a highly aquatic species in all life stages. The eggs, which you see down here at the bottom left, require water. Um, tadpoles, which are down here at the bottom center, require water, and then juveniles, shown here, and adults at the bottom right, are typically also found in and around water. These frogs spend most of their lives near ponds, marshes, springs, reservoirs, although they use upland habitat too. 
And upland just means anything that's not the wetland. So some studies have found that adult red-legged frogs can move long distances, potentially even distances up to two miles over land during, water or during winter rains between water sources. So it's gonna be not just a preservation of these breeding ponds that's important to preserve this species, but some protection for the upland habitat as well, keeping in mind the importance of these migration corridors. They have a generalist diet. Generalist just means they pretty much eat anything that fits in their mouth. The diet of California red-legged frogs is pretty variable. The most common food items are invertebrates, things like dragonflies, but for really large adult frogs, vertebrates like Pacific chorus frogs and California mice can represent up to half of their diet. So they don't shy away from eating other small animals as well. Um, one time at a pond on the preserve, I observed a really interesting three frog interaction that I think really illustrates some, some of the facts that I like the most about frogs. So I saw three frogs together. There was one California red-legged frog male who was very intent on mating. He was grasping around the waist of a female California red-legged frog, waiting for her to release her eggs into the water so that he could fertilize them. She, however, was not terribly interested in mating, so she was giving him a piggyback ride as she was going around in search of food. And in fact, by the time I saw them, she had two little frog feet sticking out of her mouth. She had eaten a chorus frog and was digesting that chorus frog. So there was an attempted mating going on and there was some predation going on, which I think sums up a frog's life pretty nicely. Frogs are pretty simple-minded and pretty focused. And that's one of the things I like best about them. If you go out to a pond, you'll see frogs just sort of sitting and waiting for something to happen. They don't really move until they see something that they want. If it's something that's smaller than them, they'll try to eat it. If it's bigger than them and frog-shaped, then they'll try to mate with it. If it's bigger than them and pretty scary, like me, it causes them to jump into the water. So they're pretty, uh, pretty simple-minded. And it's one of the things that I really admire about them is their single-minded focus on what they want. So I'm gonna talk through some of the life stages of the California red-legged frog before I get into anything depressing like threats that they face. So the first stage of a frog's life is the eggs. California red-legged frogs are breeding, depending on where they are in their range, anywhere from November through March with earlier breeding records occurring in more Southern localities. California red-legged frogs are often prolific breeders typically laying their eggs during or after large rainfall events in late winter and early spring. And around here, like on the preserve, eggs are typically laid in February and March. So right now in January, we're gearing up toward breeding season and there may be some males who are already calling and already establishing territories. The photo that you see on most of the screen here is a freshly laid egg mass this is a photo that I took with an underwater camera at a pond on the preserve. So this is a really nice substantial egg mass about the size of a grapefruit, probably several hundred eggs. This is pretty typical of what amphibian egg masses look like. Amphibian eggs are the dark spot at the center, which is the embryo, surrounded by a spherical jelly coat. So the jelly capsule is mucus, it's proteins, it's carbohydrates, and it's something that's generally unpalatable to predators. So for California red-legged frogs, this is a relatively safe life stage to be in. Although they can be threatened by sedimentation, like this egg mass up here at the top right. Um, so these egg masses are typically found attached to vegetation, pretty close to the surface of the water where it's warm, and these eggs grow and develop for about six to 14 days until tiny tadpoles wriggle free of the egg mass. And that's what we'll take a look at next. So up here at the top left is tiny tadpoles hatching from these eggs, wriggling free of that egg mass. And then the 
bottom two pictures are somewhat larger tadpoles undergoing that process of development. The technical term for these aquatic stages is larvae, but the more common term is tadpoles or polywogs. All of these mean the same thing. I'll try to say tadpoles, but if I slip up and say larvae, hopefully you'll know that I mean tadpoles. So at, the, at hatching, they look like these ones at top left. They have the goal of growing and getting as big as they can before metamorphosis, which is growing legs and leaving the pond. This bottom left is tadpoles that are about halfway through their development. And on the right side is a tadpole that's just beginning to sprout back legs. And that's my hand that's holding it for scale. So this is a pretty substantial tadpole. These California red-legged frog tadpoles are often less conspicuous than other frog tadpoles. If they're at a pond, you typically won't see them, even if you're looking for them. They're typically dark and mottled in color, and they hide in deeper water than would say chorus frog tadpoles, which you might see along the edge of the water. The process of hatching to metamorphosis takes maybe three and a half to seven months. So they would be emerging from the water as froglets from maybe May through September. This is dependent on temperature, on food availability, and on competition. What are they eating during this time? The tadpoles are grazing on the surfaces of rocks and vegetation. They're eating algae, they're eating detritus. This life stage is probably the most dangerous life stage to be in for a red-legged frog. It has the highest mortality rate of all life stages. Probably less than 1% of eggs that are laid actually survive metamorphosis and become a terrestrial stage small frog. Why is this? Number one, competition for food. You might think about algae in a pond as just a limitless resource, but it's really not, especially when you have a lot of grazers in there competing for the most nutritious and the most digestible algae. There's also a pretty high risk of predation. When the tadpoles are really small, that risk of predation can be from things like aquatic insects. When they're larger, like these, it can be from wading birds or from garter snakes. Plus, the process of metamorphosing is inherently dangerous. Um, change is always dangerous, right? These tadpoles are going from one body plan to another, rearranging many of their organ systems. They're going from using gills to breathe to using lungs to breathe. They sprout four limbs, and all of those sites where the limbs are sprouting are potential sites for infection to set in. And they have to rearrange their entire digestive system to go from being an algae scraper to predating on insects as an adult. And they can't eat while this process is occurring, while their mouth parts are rearranging, while their digestive system is rearranging. So by the time metamorphosis is done, assuming it occurs successfully, they will have lost up to a third of their body weight because it is such a stressful process. So let's say that you know, this tadpole did make it out alive and made it through metamorphosis. They're now in a stage that's called the juvenile or the subadult stage. Here is one of the one percenters who made it through that tadpole stage. They now have achieved their terrestrial form. They look like frogs. The juvenile and subadult habitat is similar to that of adults, but they spatially segregate uh, with smaller frogs, typically found in shallower water than larger frogs. It could be that they have different habitat preferences from the adults. But also, adult red-legged frogs are definitely not above cannibalism, so small frogs need to stay away from larger adults. Juveniles also are active during different times of the day. They're much more active during the day than adults are. These juveniles and subadults are feeding on insects, and they're avoiding predators like larger frogs, birds, snakes, raccoons, and they're growing for maybe up to two years for males and three years for females in order to reach sexual maturity. So at this time, they could be about the same size as a chorus frog adult. And then they grow into what are known as adults. This is when they're sexually mature. So here's a very red individual that I spotted on the preserve a few years ago. These adult forms can live for up to eight to 10 years 
These adults you'll typically see nearly always associated with permanent bodies of water. Many of the frogs remain at the breeding sites all year, while others disperse. Dispersal distances are typically less than a quarter of a mile, but some tagged individuals have been observed to disperse almost two miles away from a breeding pond. These dispersal movements are typically along riparian corridors, meaning where there's water, but some individuals, especially on rainy nights, have been shown to move directly from one site to another through areas that you'd think of as pretty inhospitable habitats, things like heavily grazed pastures with a lot of cattle. So I think this is a pretty cool species and they're really an integral part of California's natural, California's natural history. California red-legged frogs have long been a part of California culture, and this was recognized by the state in 2014 when they were named the California State Amphibian. I don't know if you knew that California has a state amphibian, but it is the California red-legged frog. This designation of California red-legged frog as the state amphibian highlighted the importance that California places on the frog's preservation and sought to acknowledge the species' important place in the ecology, culture, and history of California, and to reinforce the state's commitment to protecting endangered species. This frog is particularly well known as a result of this story that you see over here on the right. That's Mark Twain's famous 1865 story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, which featured the species. And in this story, there's a gambler who trains a frog named Daniel Webster, and he trains it to jump and is placing bets on it because he's trained it so well. He's confident in Daniel Webster's uh, performance as a jumping frog. But then a stranger weighs Daniel down with, by secretly feeding him lead shot, filling him up with lead. So he's out of the jumping competition in this famous story. It's not just Mark Twain that, who celebrated this frog. Uh, the California red-legged frog's unique place in California history extends as far back as the 19th century gold rush. The miners, the 49ers, were really big into eating frog legs. They harvested and consumed nearly 80,000 frogs per year, nearly eating this species into extinction. This frog was once so common that it was considered a staple cuisine. And now that it's lost, now it's lost 90% of its historic population. So now people are typically not eating California red-legged frogs anymore, but they still continue to face myriad natural and human-made threats including the introduction of invasive species into its habitat, as well as habitat loss. And due to these threats, in 1996, it was listed under the Endangered Species Act as a federally threatened species, and the state also classified it as a species of special concern that same year. It was further protected in 2006 when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced the the designation of 450,000 acres of critical California habitat for the threatened frog. Coincidentally, this did not involve any area in Calaveras County where this story is set. Then again, in 2010, the Fish and Wildlife Service announced over 1 million acres of protected land for the species throughout California. So there's a lot of uh, protected land that exists for this species throughout California. And some of its biggest populations are north of the Bay Area, in Monterey County, and in some relict populations in Southern California. So let's take a look at where it's found in California these days. This is a range map of the California distribution of red-legged frogs. We have two species of red-legged frogs. The California red-legged frog is found in most of the state and shown in orange. Then there's a narrow band of hybridization in Mendocino County that's shown in purple. And north of that is all the northern red-legged frog shown in red. If you're looking at this map, you see a lot of orange implying that, you know, the whole state is just lousy with California red-legged frogs, right? But obviously they're not everywhere that's indicated in orange. They need suitable habitat within this orange area 
and even where habitat exists, they may have been locally extirpated. So where are they found now? They're found in a few parts of the Central Coast Range, including on the Monterey Peninsula, where we still have some large, vigorous populations of California red-legged frogs. There are some found up in Marin County, north of San Francisco. And there are some parts of Southern California and down into Baja, where we find populations of this frog as well. And I'm gonna show you an updated map to show you where are they actually found and how this frog got listed on the Endangered Species Act. So on the left there is a historical map. The gray area indicates the range in which they're found and the dots are specific sites in which they're found. On the right is what the landscape looked like for California red-legged frogs in 1996, the year the species was put on the endangered species list. This is Fisher and Schaefer, 1996, showing historical records from the Great Central Valley and remaining populations in 1996. The frog's historical range extended from about Point Reyes on coastally and from up to Redding and down to Baja, California. The remaining populations are primarily found in three different counties, Monterey, uh, Marin, and San Luis Obispo. There are factors that are associated with declining populations, including the number one threat to biodiversity everywhere, which is habitat degradation and loss. Habitat degradation occurs through agriculture, through urbanization, mining, overgrazing, recreation, timber harvesting, impoundments, water diversions, degraded water quality, pesticides, you name it. Introduced plants and predators also play a role and the reason for decline and the degree of threat vary by geographic location. California red-legged frog populations are threatened by more than one factor in most locations. Um, one of the reasons that California red-legged frogs might be threatened are the introduced American bullfrog, shown here consuming another large frog. Bullfrogs, are listed by the IUCN as one of the world's worst invasive species. And this is due primarily to their impacts on native amphibians. They were introduced to California to satisfy the demand for frog legs after red-legged frogs were eaten into scarcity. Bullfrogs are great source of frog legs because they're extremely large bodied with extremely large legs. Large body size, however, presents a few problems for native species. Frogs, like I said, tend to eat smaller frogs, and almost all frogs are smaller than bullfrogs. So all frogs are pretty much at risk of getting eaten by bullfrogs. I told you that frogs love to eat other frogs. Another thing is that smaller frogs love to try to mate with larger frogs. So this is a picture of a hopeful red-legged frog suitor on the right on the piggyback ride. And this is a confused female bullfrog underneath who's being courted. This hopeful red-legged frog on the right is not just wasting his reproductive efforts by trying to mate with somebody who's not his species. He's also running the risk of her turning around and eating him. So there's a lot of threats that bullfrogs can present to California red-legged frogs. These large-bodied generalist bullfrogs can directly eat or outcompete native frogs. But some of their strongest impacts are actually not in the adult stage, but in the tadpole stages. And these tadpoles are also really enormous. This isn't one that I saw, but it's a picture that I saw recently and I just had to share it with you. This is a bullfrog tadpole that somebody found and was showing online recently. I was amazed when I saw it. They named this one Goliath because it's perhaps the largest bullfrog tadpole ever found. He's likely several years old. They aren't typically this big, but they are really big. So he, that one's about the size of a banana and he dwarfs that cores can. Um, the ones I see are typically more about this size when they start sprouting legs, more like six inches rather than 10 inches. I've seen individuals about the size of the one that's on the screen right now in the few ponds on the preserve where bullfrogs do live and reproduce. 
So this is a bullfrog tadpole preparing for metamorphosis. You can see that those back legs are sprouting out. That's an indication that the process has started. So, so I said that some of the biggest impacts of bullfrogs on California red-legged frogs and other native amphibians occurs in this tadpole stage. And it really has to do with how their breeding patterns overlap with each other. So I'm gonna show a timeline of phenology. Phenology just means the timing of life cycle events. And the threat really comes from how these life cycle events overlap. So as is typical for a California native species, California red-legged frogs, CRLF, typically lay their eggs in February. Here's the start of a year here, January, February. They're laying their eggs at about February. Tadpoles emerge from the eggs and they grow and develop through the spring, through the summer, and then typically metamorphose and leaves the pond as juveniles, let's say on average about at August. And this is a typical breeding pattern for California native amphibians following the rainfall patterns that we typically get, right? This is when rain is filling up the ponds. And by the time we get to August, September, they're in danger of drying. Bullfrogs, which I've shown below as BF, are a different story. They're, they lay eggs right around June, midsummer, which is typical for an East Coast species. That's the warm and wet season on the East Coast where they're native to. Their tadpoles emerge from eggs in the summer and continue to grow throughout the summer and throughout the fall. And then they sort of overwinter. It's kind of like hibernation. It's lower activity levels. Bullfrogs, because they're used to warmer temperatures, have a poor cold tolerance. So throughout the winter, tadpoles and adults are largely inactive. And then they continue to grow throughout the spring and throughout the summer, getting really, really big, and metamorphose the following September. So they actually spend more than one year in the tadpole stage, at least one year. Some tadpoles overwinter for multiple years, continuing to grow and grow. This is relevant for our native species, as this means that each spring, there's a period where newly hatched, really small tadpoles of native species are exposed to these much larger overwintered bullfrog tadpoles which can outcompete them for algal resources. They can be vectors of disease, um, or they can directly predate upon smaller tadpoles. Now, tadpoles aren't particularly effective predators. They don't have the biting mouth parts for it, but if they come up with their scraping mouth parts and scrape at the round balloon-like body of a smaller tadpole, either on purpose or as part of a feeding frenzy, that smaller tadpole's body will just sort of pop like a water balloon, resulting in mortality and resulting in other tadpoles feeding on that tadpole. So for these reasons, competition, disease spreading, some predation, often native species tadpoles do not survive in the presence of bullfrog tadpoles. So this is one of the questions that I set out to answer with my dissertation research. We know that bullfrogs certainly have strong negative impacts on native amphibians in areas where they've been introduced, but it's also true that in some areas, coexistence has been observed between these two species. So I wanted to know, um, under what conditions can California red-legged frogs and bullfrogs coexist, given that bullfrogs seem to be in California to stay? So, this question was interesting to me because, you know, like the bullfrog, I'm a transplant from the East Coast. I came from Virginia to Davis to enroll at the ecology program at UC Davis and wanted to study the interactions of native and invasive amphibians out here. I had heard all about how bad bullfrogs are and about the plight of the red-legged frog, and I wanted to examine this relationship further by looking at where both species are found. <clears throat> 
So, <laughs> oh, I hope I don't lose my voice. What I started to do was do field surveys up and down the central coast where these frogs were. I started to do field surveys at the Santa Lucia Preserve where I was found from 2014 to 2017. So if you have a pond near your house, you may have seen a small woman with a colorful hair and a dip net. That was me. And the reason that I was hanging out near ponds on your property, excuse me for a second, I have a tissue. Okay, sorry friends, still recovering from COVID over here. Um, the reason that I was hanging out at ponds on your property is that I had this notion that bullfrogs would be a strong negative predictor of California red-legged frog presence at a pond. So part of my dissertation research was going out to ponds and testing that notion and seeing what amphibians were present. So what I was doing was going out and looking for frogs. Now, how do you look for frogs? You go out to a pond and believe it or not, you start looking with binoculars. They're not just good for birds. <coughs> the basic technique for conducting aquatic surveys is to use binoculars to scan for basking frogs, to slowly walk along the water on the adjacent bank, and to use a dip net to capture larvae and adults. So you may have spotted a frog on this slide already. It's right there. It's a pretty typical pose for a frog during the day. It has just eyes, nose and mouth out of the water, ready to capture any dragonfly that gets too close. Additionally, a dip net is necessary for locating and catching amphibian larvae in general. I'm walking along the edge of the water, sweeping a dip net at regular intervals, and trying to find tadpoles, see what life stages, what species, what numbers, and additionally, if there are aquatic insects present, what's there. In this picture, looks like I must have gotten something good. I'm really smiling about the contents of that dip net. In addition to doing surveys during the day, I was conducting some nocturnal surveys and these are conducted by doing a similar procedure, walking up to a pond at night and using a bright light to look for eye shine of adult amphibians. Frogs have eyes that shine at night, like those of raccoons, dogs, cats, cows, etc. But because their eyes are really small, what's necessary to do is hold the flashlight up at the level of your eye and scan around the pond to look for the reflection of frog eyes. Often, this requires the simultaneous use of a flashlight and binoculars, binoculars with one hand, flashlight in the other, scanning and looking for frog eyes. Surprisingly, the eye shine from spiders can look really remarkably similar to that of frogs, so it takes some practice to be able to distinguish the two. What I would also do at night is conduct auditory species, auditory surveys for many species, this entails arriving at a site at least an hour after sunset and remaining quiet and still for about 10 minutes and the frogs start to chorus. In this way, I could assess um, what species are there and in what numbers on a scale of just zero to three, where zero is none, one is one or two distinct individuals calling, two is overlapping calls, and three is a loud chorus. So I'm gonna play you a recording of what you might hear if you were to approach a pond during the breeding season. What you'll hear is a lot of chorus frogs calling. That's that deafening chorus that you'll be accustomed to if you've been anywhere near water during the breeding season. And then you'll hear a deeper sort of growling, snoring sound. That's the most beautiful sound in the world. That's the song of the California red-legged frog. And what you'll hear is a couple of males calling, one slightly farther away, so he's a little quieter, and a chorus of chorus frogs. So I'll go ahead and play that. Thank you. 
So what you're hearing is a level three Pacific chorus frog just going constantly in the background. And then that low chuckle is level one California red-legged frog. There are probably one or two individuals calling right there. So if you ever hear a, a, a deep growling or sort of a chortling, snoring sound like that, that's California red-legged frogs calling. Everything in the background, that's chorus frogs. I did some additional work during these nocturnal surveys. I didn't mean to play that again. And during these night surveys, I had some additional questions that I wanted to ask. Um, I captured some individuals in order to be able to assess their body condition. In order to do this, I would approach them with a bright light, which I would shine directly into their face, which essentially stuns them. They don't move. And then I would pick them up and I would measure their weight and length to find out how big and how fat or skinny they are. The weight is on the left with the frog in a bag being weighed with a spring scale. And then on the right, I have a red-legged frog in hand against a ruler measuring the length from the nose to the tail. Now I imagine for these frogs, this whole experience feels a lot like getting abducted by UFOs would for us. You know, these frogs are just minding their own business and then they see a really bright light. They fly up into the sky where they're examined by some strange creature. And then before they know it, they're back at the pond. The other frogs probably don't believe them when they tell them what happened. So I was measuring the presence of these frogs, looking at their body condition. And I also thought that habitat features might play a role in whether red-legged frogs and bullfrogs coexist at the landscape. So I was measuring some habitat characteristics as well. These were things like tree cover, size of the water body, average and maximum depth of the water body, how turbid or cloudy the water is, uh, the types and abundance of vegetation, whether there were other species present, the proximity to human activities of various types. And I had all of these measured at 67 ponds across the central California coast. So I'm about to give you a crazy graph warning. This is the result of all of these factors being studied. I promise this is the only graph I'll show. So this nine panel graph is the results of my analysis. These are the nine most important factors that predict whether or not a red-legged frog population will be present at a given pond. So for each one of these panels, on the y-axis is the probability of California red-legged frog presence. For the TLDR, too long didn't read, the main cause of the population decline seems to be habitat loss and destruction, but introduced species like American bullfrogs might also be a factor. Here, I used a boosted regression tree approach where I included predictor variables like habitat characteristics, other species, and measures of human activity, and resulted in a model that explained 87% of the variance of why red-legged frogs were at a pond or not at a pond. So the biggest, most important determining factors turned out to be not bullfrogs like I was suspecting, but all of these along the top row, these are all the strongest predictors of whether red-legged frogs will be present at a pond. Uh, the most powerful predictor was the distance to trail with increased distance, increasing the probability of California red-legged frog presence and the same trend being observed for distance to dirt road. The good news is that the threshold distance for how far away a trail needs to be and how far away a road needs to be doesn't have to be very far at all before this effect disappears. The third most powerful predictor was the condition of the pond, which I ranked on a scale of one being absolutely pristine, something like maybe a pond found at the far reaches of the preserve, maybe off the end of Long Ridge Trail. And on the far right, a five would be a heavily modified pond something like Moore's Lake or the ponds found on the golf courses. So we found that 
ponds that were less modified were more likely to have red-legged frogs present at them. The next few factors were all conditions related to local habitat conditions. Um, these were size of the pond with smaller ponds being more likely to support populations of red-legged frogs. A couple of factors related to vegetation, that is increased vegetation diversity with more than one guild of vegetation present at a pond was a good predictor of red-legged frog presence and increased vegetation overall benefited red-legged frog presence. I also found that increased turbidity, oddly enough, was a positive predictor of red-legged frog presence. That might be something that's correlated with area, with smaller ponds being more likely to be more turbid and also more likely to dry seasonally. The last couple of factors were other species that were present at a pond. California red-legged frogs were more likely to be found at ponds that were also occupied by the California newt, that one that I showed you a picture of earlier. I don't really know what that's about. It could just indicate a thriving ecosystem supports both species, or they could be similarly, similarly susceptible to human activity or pesticides. They were less likely, as I suspected, to be found in ponds where American bullfrogs were present, but it turns out that they're much less important. They're much less of a predictive factor than I thought. So this work from my dissertation indicates that the real impact on California red-legged frogs is from human activity and human impacts on the landscape and modification of California red-legged frog habitat. It may be that you know, bullfrogs do have this slightly negative impact on California red-legged frogs, but bullfrogs are also really highly associated with humans and with human modifications of habitat. So it could be that the presence of bullfrogs just tends to go along with all of these other metrics as well. Now, in natural environments that aren't so modified, these species may rarely overlap or they may be able to coexist when they do. Um, I finished up my dissertation work a while ago, but there's still important conservation and research efforts going on at the preserve. The preserve and the conservancy work together to protect and monitor amphibian species across ponds and in upland habitat. Some of those efforts include conservation grazing. You might have seen cows or goats on the preserve. They're reducing dead organic material. They're helping to manage brush and weeds. They're benefiting native pollinators and other grassland dependent species. But it's not just wildflowers that benefit from this conservation grazing. It's species like California red-legged frogs and California tiger salamanders, both of which use upland habitats tiger salamanders to live and burrow in, and California red-legged frogs to forage in and travel through. Both of them are benefiting from these conservation grazing efforts. These preservation efforts are really important because a preserve represents a lot of aquatic and a lot of upland habitat. There are 35 stock ponds on the preserve that provide critical habitat to California tiger salamanders, red-legged frogs, chorus frogs, newts, and every year, the Conservancy is conducting aquatic surveys for tiger salamanders and red-legged frogs using approved net-based detection methods like the ones I was doing. But in addition to those net surveys, there's a really new interesting project going on at the preserve, which is using a new type of amphibian detection. And this is information on this project. This is being led by Mitch Ralston, who is a master's student from Washington State University. And this year, 2022, will be the second year of the project. This project is called Radical Rare Amphibian Detection in California. And it aims to detect some of those focal species that we were just talking about across Monterey Bay wetlands. This is a two-year project with multiple collaborators, including the Santa Lucia Preserve and Conservancy. And they're also relevant to you, engaging the local community by bringing on volunteers and working with private landowners to survey their wetlands. In this process, they're using what's called eDNA surveys. eDNA surveys are in contrast to the traditional surveys that you see in this picture with dip nets and seines. For these 
DIPnet and SANE based methods. It can be difficult to detect elusive species like our species of concern. And it's also fairly invasive. It involves going in, stirring up the water, scaring animals. However, Mitch and his team are using this entirely new wildlife survey method that's called environmental DNA or eDNA to detect imperiled amphibians. And instead of going in with nets and seines and trying to capture individuals, all they have to do is take a water sample. eDNA is genetic material that's released by animals into the water, things like dead skin cells, mucus, and so on. And environmental DNA is unique to each species and allows for an accounting of who's who at a pond. You can think of it like a barcode, like, an, like you would see on an item at the store. Each barcode is unique to each species. So Mitch has been collecting water samples at wetlands and then analyzing them at the Washington State University eDNA lab. If his team detects eDNA in a particular sample, that means the species is present at that pond. This is a less destructive method. It's more time and money efficient. And that means that they can survey more wetlands across the Monterey Bay area in the same amount of time and with less money. And it's often more sensitive and more accurate than the traditional survey techniques like the ones that I was using. So overall, this project is really cool. It's helping to develop eDNA survey methods and protocols for natural resources managers to help them detect these focal amphibian species and other species of special interest in California. And here's an example of one of the amphibians that his team detected on the preserve. This is a larval California tiger salamander. The aquatic stages have external gills and a beautiful greenish iridescent color. It's really distinct from the black with the yellow dots that the adults have. And Mitch said that I should definitely share his contact information with you. The best way to contact him would be through his email, mitch.ralston, ralston at wsu.edu. Mitch and his team are always looking for volunteers to help with surveying, and they're always also on the lookout for additional ponds that they could add to their survey list this spring. They're going to be primarily surveying early March through early May to catch the breeding season of many of these amphibians. And I think with that, it could be a good time to switch to questions. I've told you about some um, some projects that are going on on the preserve, as well as some stuff that I was working on. So if you have any questions about what I was working on, about the species, or about ongoing research, I can do my best to try to answer them. And it looks like we have yeah, maybe 10 minutes left. Please feel free to just speak up. Um, or if you're more comfortable, go ahead and throw your questions in the chat and we'll read them loud. I have a question. My name is Kirsten. It says Brooke, it's my daughter, but um, okay. I, <laughs> I am, I am uh, the, in, one of the environmental education uh, specialists for the San Lucia Conservancy. And I wanna thank you so much. You just, your presentation was amazing. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah. And I have a question for you. Perfect. Are there any color variations that you see? Um, I have found them in Potrero Canyon mm -hmm. over the years. And um, I have seen some that are very, they seem very yellow. Hmm. And I'm wondering if you ever see that. Yes, I definitely see color variations. Like I said, there are some that are, you know, very rarely brightly tomato red, right? But that's the, the exception to the rule. They're primarily dark brown, but I've seen them be light brown. And some of them, yes, can be yellowish. I haven't seen that um, it necessarily corresponds to locality. It just seems to be on an individual genetic basis. But there's definitely some pretty big variation in their coloration. And that wouldn't be confused because there, there aren't any yellow-legged frogs, right, here in this region? Um, there are yellow-legged frogs more um, east of here, but I don't think that you would find them in Potrero Canyon. Right. Would they be coastal, like on the Monterey Peninsula? I haven't seen them on the peninsula, no. Okay. Because yeah. I, I, I have three acres of Monterey pine habitat 
And I find a very yellowed variation and there are red, red legged frogs here. Mm -hmm. um, and they land on my windows. Um, I have a chorus outside my house right now. Oh, lovely. And um, yeah, and so they'll jump on my windows and, I, and they're larger than I was, you know, thinking they were Pacific mm -hmm. tree frogs. Right. Okay. And, and the Pacific tree frog, these are very large and, and I'm seeing them from underneath and mm -hmm. they're very tan and longer and yellowed. Interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't expect red-legged frogs to be landing on windows. Okay. Um, so that's not seeing, their behavior. <laughs> yeah, if you're seeing chorus frogs, you'll see that they have the rounded toe tips, which they okay. use for climbing. And they also have a dark, dark mask yeah. over the eye, the bandit mask. Right. They can have a lot of different colors, but a really key characteristic to look for for chorus frogs is that dark stripe over the eye. And is that, is the chorus frog the same as the Pacific tree frog? Yes. Okay. So, Thank yes. You. Yes. yes. It's all the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. They, they're very different looking. They don't have that stripe and um, they have that more red legged frog look, but I, mm. I found a couple um, that are just very yellowy red. They're not that tomatoy red. Yeah, they're very rarely that tomato red. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sure. So we have a hand up from Karen Hargrove. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Rachel, thank you so much for your uh, presentation today. I learned a lot. So I'm so I, glad. It's two questions. And I love your, your energy and excitement about frogs. One, uh, we have unfortunately a pool cover that collects water. Mm -hmm. And during these periods, there seems to be a, a very strong frog chorus. And I assume that those are bullfrogs and not very great. And, and then, so that's one question. And second, I'd love for you to go back to that chart about why we don't have red-legged frogs because the theory has always been presented that I've heard in the past is that it is because of bullfrogs mm -hmm. um, predation. And what your research says draws a bit of a different conclusion. So I wanna make sure I really understand that well. Sure. So. Yeah. To answer your first question, if somebody's calling from a pool cover, it's almost certainly chorus frogs. So if you're hearing, ear, 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 that's chorus frogs. Bullfrogs would be pretty distinct. They're, this is a great party trick. They're more of a warm, warm, warm. So you'd, you'd know if you have bullfrogs. Um, loud. <laughs> let me see if I can go back there. Yeah, I was also surprised to find that at least at the ponds that I was surveying, that the presence of bullfrogs alone was not a particularly strong predictor of red-legged frogs being present at a given habitat. That doesn't mean that they don't have negative effects. They're certainly well documented to have negative effects on native amphibians. They are carriers, but largely unaffected by some big amphibian diseases, including chytrid and some ranaviruses, which they can spread around. They're definitely really big frogs. So they're strong predators, strong competitors. But it seems like in the type of habitats that California red-legged frogs would historically be using, that is small ponds that dry seasonally, bullfrogs aren't likely to have that strong an impact. Remember that bullfrogs have to spend more than one year as a tadpole. So if a pond dries in September, October, that means bullfrogs can't breed there. And that's gonna limit the, in, the influence that they can have on native species at a particular pond. I like that description at the end. That will stick with me. I'll remember that. Okay, I'm so glad. Yeah, awesome. thank you, Rachel. Sure. So we have, uh, we have a question in the chats from Serena. Are there any negative interactions between these frogs and rodents, such as rats? Mm. Actually, um, frogs are known to predate upon rodents. So there are negative interactions, but it is a one way where the frogs do consume rodents, things like the California mouse, Paramiscus. So they're actually known to eat small vertebrates, maybe not the size of rats, but things the size of mice. And Vivian has her hand up. Hi, Rachel. I want to um, echo what Karen just said. That was a very engaging and educational and fun presentation. So thank you. 
Um, but I also want to ask because um, we have this great, I don't know if you've seen it, this conservation, no, this living in the preserve conservation guide. And it mm -hmm. was only because of that that I realized what this lump of red goo was, which was actually a California newt um, that we often find around us. We have the um, San Jose Creek that runs behind mm -hmm. their property and seeing this chart which you have in front of us right now mm -hmm. um i'm wondering if it's possible because you see that you say that the presence of california newts perhaps is an indicator of greater um population potential mm -hmm. for this red-legged frog the california uh does the san jose creek trick turns down to a trickle pretty much um in the dry season so i'm wondering as well if that's also a habitat where we might be looking for the frogs Sure, if it's a habitat with, that fills with enough water during the rainy season and has enough sunlight and vegetation, and typically if it's a creek, what you'd be looking for is areas of more still water where eggs can be laid and where tadpoles can be raised. And if water remains in sufficient depth throughout you know, the spring and the summer, then it's certainly a place where frogs could be reproducing. It could also be, even if it's not a breeding habitat, it could be habitat that's used for foraging, that's used for, um, that's used by adults. So it could be definitely habitat that's used for breeding or simply for adult habitat. Cool. Well, thanks. I'll be on the lookout. Okay. Sounds good. Go out there at night, get your flashlight. I will. <laughs> I'll warn my neighbors first. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. Are there any more questions? We have reached 6.30, so um, to be respectful of everybody's time, we'll wrap it up if there are no more questions. I have one last question. If you find red, if you find red legged frogs somewhere mm -hmm. because of their special status, mm -hmm. what kind of impact would that have on a place? Would it protect? What kind of protection would happen like in research if suddenly red-legged frogs were found somewhere that weren't, they didn't know that they were there previously. Right. Um, it sort of depends on who you tell, right? Um, so it, it could be that that, that that habitat could be somewhat restricted in terms of what type of development could take place there. Um, but there are protections for landowners who have land on which California red-legged frogs or other endangered species are found. For instance, people or organizations can enter into habitat protection plans with the Fish and Wildlife Service that essentially says, I'm going to do the best that I can to protect these endangered species, but also, you know, I, it's my land and I want to develop it. So mm -hmm. there, there are possible protections for them. There's also protections for landowners. So if you find them on your property, then you'll, you can work with, um, you know, the knowledge and try to do everything you can to keep their habitat and not disturb them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. That was an excellent presentation and we are going to wrap it up here. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. If anybody's got further questions, feel free to um, communicate with me via email. My email was on that first slide, but it's, I'll put it in the chat if I can find it. I can't find it. It's rachel.betts.anderson at gmail.com. I can send it in a follow-up email as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Alex. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Stay well. Thanks. Feel, feel quickly. <laughs> okay.